going to have this amazing um, keynote session with Phyllis Fair. And I'm going to let each of them introduce themselves um, and you know, give them give what they think is important about their background. Um, Al Power and Daniela um, Green. So, Functionally, from a social model aspect, 
um, they need assistance to engage fully as citizens. And they do qualify. Everybody with a disability has a disease or an injury or some condition of birth. Dementia absolutely qualifies uh, as a person who is living with, with a disability or a disability. Um, so in the uh, 2017 WHO Global Action Plan on the public health response to dementia, they affirmed that, yes, absolutely, um, people with dementia are included in this. Uh, so we have this, we have this aspiration uh, of human rights for people in the dementia, and, and I think most of us, in, in essence, would agree with that. Uh, certainly, the people in this room. But I think it's not so simple when you get into it. When you look at what the CRPP says, which was written really more thinking about people with physical or intellectual disabilities, and then um, applying. And when we look around at our systems of care and support, we realize that we really are not fulfilling it's not even close to fulfilling this. And, um, and there's a lot of questions that need to be sorted out. This is not a easy thing. Um, and it, it raises questions. Do all humans have the same intrinsic value? Does that level of value change if you uh, change your ability living with dementia? Um, that's, uh, you might say you know the answer, but once again, when you look at our practices, do people's human rights, do their rights to certain things change uh, as they live in different phases of dementia? Uh, so uh, to just make that a little more concrete, I just want to summarize a couple of the articles in the uh, CRPD. And I want you to think about this. And think about the people you know living with dementia, all different kinds of people. And I think you can see why this is not an easy thing. Uh, early, in the, early in the CRPD, there are some articles that talk about um, general principles and obligations. So the general principles that are used are a respect for inherent dignity and autonomy of persons with disabilities, non-discrimination, participation, inclusion, equality, and accessibility. The general obligations include um, designing good service facilities, policies, and program. Say that the member states actually need to take this and enact policies and program to see that it happens. And that states parties must prohibit all discrimination on the basis of disability and people have equal protection. Um, there are certainly things about accessibility, of course, and once again, uh, ever since our Americans with Disability Act, we think of accessibility as things like wheelchair ramps and power systems, of course, and, and that's very important. But um, are community spaces and public buildings accessible in the way they need to be for people with um, changing cognitive abilities? And, um, a few others. Article 12. Persons with disabilities have the same standing as others to exercise the legal capacity, and if the state has obligations to provide support to assist persons with disabilities in making decisions and exercising legal capacity. This is all about supportive decision making, not just deciding because there's some things you can't do that you don't have the ability to choose and substituting and taking that away from you. Um, Legal protection against threats to human rights, arbitrary detention, and also cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment. Now, that sounds a lot like torture and some of the things that Geneva Convention talks about. But I have to say, we see degrading treatment of people with dementia all the time. You've seen it. You know what happens. Um, living independently and being included in the community. Uh, the people with disabilities need to be included in the community with equal access to community services and facilities. Uh, talk a lot about inclusion and whether we really honor that for people. We even have states with regulations that say if you need to live in an assisted living environment, you must be behind a locked door only with other people with dementia. It's actually a regulation. Uh, not true in all states, but in some. Respect for privacy. Um, the same right, um, here's a good one. The right to choose where, how, and with whom they live. The right to form relations, intimate and otherwise. Right to get equal access of the same standard of health care and services of others. I want to skip article 21 and I want to finish with that because it's important to me. Habilitation and rehabilitation. And we've talked this week already about um, whether people have the right, whether, whether insurance will pay for a person to get there, get a diagnosis of dementia. The answer is they don't. Um, to promote employment in the private sector and to ensure reasonable accommodation is provided. How many people have actually uh, been uh, Discharge from their job instead of finding accommodations when they reveal you know, they have a The last one I want to mention is Article 21 because it's special to me and some of the work that got me started down this road. 
freedom of expression and opinion. Persons with disabilities enjoy the ability to share their thoughts, beliefs, and feelings through all forms of communication. What does that sound like? Robert Bowles, I'm going to come back to Robert. <laughs> Who's looking for another term? Oh, okay. Um, and and uh, you know, as I I've recently said sometimes that my own personal journey and leading me to, to a group like the Mention Action Alliance has had three phases when I started over a decade ago challenging our system of care and support. Uh, to me, it was about antipsychotics. It was about we shouldn't be using these drugs. They're not safe. They're not effective. Um, but after a while, when I worked with that and talked about it, I realized that antipsychotics was a problem. They were just a symptom of a system that did not know how to support the well-being of people living in dementia. And I've worked with that for a long time. But somewhere along the line, working with folks at the table here and the folks around the world who are advocating, I realized it goes deeper than that. It's really about human rights. It's really about justice for people. Um, and do you have the right to, to express yourself? without being given a sedative medication, um, because we don't want to try to understand what it is that you're trying to communicate, or we label things, we stigmatize um, So that's what I want to say. I just want to finish up uh, one thing, at, with one thing, and um, um, after I'm up here, I feel she's going to talk about her real world experience as an advocate, including the dementia. And then uh, Daniela will be speaking about the CRPD in reference to those people living in later phases of dementia who uh, cannot be here today to contribute their voices to the uh, discussion. Very important, uh, very important gap yeah, sometimes in the discussion. Um, but when I listen to the panel this morning, and I've traveled around the world, and I hear people with dementia say the same stories about their diagnosis as a doctor, you know, it's really difficult. Um, and I was in a, quite a discussion about that um, yesterday. And it occurred to me, since I'm up here to talk about human rights, that there's a human right we don't talk about very much. And that is the right to hope. What happened to the human right to hope? Um, and I was saying yesterday that I think, at least in the US and the medical profession, we kind of perverted what hope is. We have hope when we have something that can make your condition go away. But if we don't have that, then we don't talk. And one of the skills that physicians seem to lack is the ability to deliver a very uh, powerful, disturbing diagnosis. Maybe, maybe some of the most important patient meetings we will have in our career, but to inject a sense of hope, you know, get busy living or get busy dying, as, as, um, as uh, Mike says. And it, um, it just reminded me of a quote by um, the, former, the late poet, the former uh, Czech president, Papa that I wanted to share with you. And um, I remember it. Um, he said that, um, Hope is not a prognostication. It's an orientation of the spirit. Hope is definitely not the same thing as optimism. It is not the certainty that things will turn out well, but the belief that things make sense regardless of how they turn out. Life is too precious a thing to permit its evaluation by living pointlessly, empty, without meaning, Without hope, I'm without hope. Thanks. Good morning. I was first introduced to Alzheimer's at the age of approximately 14. On my school lunches, I would visit my grandparents to see if they needed any. I would find notes on the fridge that somebody who had stolen their butter and potatoes. Then, one day, I arrived to hear my bedroom grandfather yelling, Mary, you left the stove on. Shortly after this, my grandmother was diagnosed with Alzheimer's, and she came to live with us. It was the silent elephant in the room. She was put on no medication. She was sent home. This was back in the 60s. She had a progressive decline sitting in her rocking chair. Let's jump ahead to the 80s, early 90s. My parents moved to Hamilton from British Columbia. My mother was treated like a princess on a pedestal by my dad. 
It wasn't until my father passed away that we realized my mother was showing signs of dementia. Again, my parents had chosen to hide this. Was this due to the stigma surrounding the disease or the lack of knowledge about the disease? Again, treatment was no medication and it was supportive treatment only. Yeah, let's jump ahead again to 2007. I was 48 years of age at the time. I was noticing some concerning symptoms, which included some confusion, word finding difficulty, unable to multitask, and misplacing things, and being unable to get the written word on paper. So to me, to make a long story short, it took me five years to get a diagnosis of early onset Alzheimer's. This was shocking to me. I was an ICU nurse at the time of my diagnosis. And I knew what was going on with me and for it to take five years for the doctor to come up with the decision of what it was. It was, it was to me, it was appalling. The medical field should have caught up a lot quicker. So the next thing I'm going to talk about is some stigma. And where does stigma begin? I think it begins at diagnosis. If you look at how you were informed that you have Alzheimer's or dementia, when I look at my own diagnosis, when the doctor walked in the room, she didn't speak to me. She didn't even look at me. She spoke to my husband, told him that I had early onset Alzheimer's, and diverted me back when I couldn't rest myself. So at that point, the stigma had already been introduced. I have Alzheimer's. I can no longer think for myself. That's why she spoke to my husband. Thinking about when you're home, when you tell your family that you have Alzheimer's, do you notice a difference in how you're treated and how you're spoken to? Some of them even leave it totally. The same thing happens with your friends. I have a friend who had gone to the doctors because she was starting to notice the signs and symptoms. When she got to the doctors, the doctor said to her, why would you want to know whether you have Alzheimer's? <laughs> There's nothing that can be done for it. There was an incident where I was participating in a hackathon for Alzheimer's. At some point during the weekend, a doctor came up to me and said, I can't believe you have Alzheimer's. People who have Alzheimer's just don't know. They don't know they have it. Again, here we go, stigma and then misconception on Alzheimer's. At another education day, I spoke, and during the question period, a physician came up, and his question was if I could still cry. Well, yeah, I could still cry. Um, and he looked at me and he says, I'd be hard pressed to diagnose you with Alzheimer's. And I wanted to yell at her. I've been tested more than twice, and each time it's shown Alzheimer's. So what does a person look like who has Alzheimer's? <laughs> That's why I think it's so important that we change stereotyping and stigma around Alzheimer's. People assume that people living with Alzheimer's cannot participate. They cannot voice opinions. They have no thoughts on things. This is this just furthers the stigma around Alzheimer's. By the end of this conference, my hope is that we have changed your minds on how you see dementia and the person who is living well with dementia. One of my early memories after I was diagnosed. I had been withdrawn and I was starting to come around um, and change up what I could do. And I went to the local Alzheimer's Society and I started to volunteer. At one point, I heard somebody <coughs> say, I don't want to tell us to do this. She's doing enough. And I remember thinking, you know, they shouldn't be making these decisions for me. They should be asking me and allowing me make these decisions. It is this protection 
that they want to give people with dementia. But it really, whose call is it made? It's my call. It's Mike's call. It's Lori's call. It's Paul Ann's call. You know, anybody with, living with dementia, it's our, it's our call to make what we can do and what we want to do. When people know you have dementia, they watch the mistakes that you make. Then they use these mistakes to ask you to leave. It doesn't matter if you're in the gym, at that group, size program, or a weekly party. People automatically assume you've lost your intelligence, your, know your knowledge, and your ability to, to engage. This is why we fight every day to stay engaged and teach others about Alzheimer's and dementia. This is so important so that we can live better lives and be included in everything that goes on around us. Stigma breeds disengaged and not on our part, on the parts of everybody around us who do not understand dementia or Alzheimer's. I feel this is why people with Alzheimer's band together and form groups to make change to society. They know that when they band together with others with the same disease process, that these people understand and that they are fully accepted. We may not all have the same form of the disease or the same symptoms, but we understand what the other person is going through. We all have human rights. I feel that people forget that we have human rights when we're diagnosed with Alzheimer's. Our human rights are no longer existent and are not taken into consideration. That is why I made it a goal to change the way I the way of looking at human rights for people living with Alzheimer's. Now, in our, not in our basic human rights, but to have us included in the charter of rights of people with disabilities. We are, we are included in the charter, but not by name. We are included under cognitive impairment. That is why I feel it's highly important for us to stand up and get out there and let other people know that this is unacceptable. It needs to change. And I'm going to talk about human rights under the Charter of Rights of People with Disabilities. I'm going to choose a few articles for us to look at closely, just so you're aware and know what people living with dementia are entitled to. Some of these are the same that I'll talk about. Article 12, Equal Recognition Before the Law. Frequently people with Alzheimer's and dementia are not recognized before the law and they are automatically assumed incompetent. This is something that we really need to work on because competency is highly important and quite frequently taken away from us. Article 15, freedom from torture or cruel or inhumane treatment <laughs> or degrading treatment or punishment. When I look at this article, I think of the treatment we receive in care homes and aged care. I know things are changing and the way people with dementia are being treated is much better, but I still completely see them on long wards and tied to a wheelchair. And to me, this is just not right. Article 19, living independently and being included in the community. <coughs> it is our hope that we live independently in our own homes for as long as we can. That is why we include, that is why we are included in our community. But this is not happening due to the stigma. We frequently are not included. As an example, my grandmother had dementia and would go to church. We had a seat that we had always sat in. And slowly, she was pushed further back in the church. That is why the thought of dementia-friendly communities is so highly important to me. Article 22, respect for privacy. I feel our respect for privacy is worked out from under us at the very first appointment with the gerontologist. When, we're here, when we receive the letter, it states we have to bring a family member with us. <coughs> we are not asked if it's okay. So to me, this disregards my privacy and the privacy of my medical records. Article 25, on health. We are all entitled to the proper health care. And I feel that once we have dementia, we don't truly really receive the type of health care we deserve. 
As an example, I've gone to the doctors over the last year complaining of a swollen problem. They kept putting it off. When I finally asked for a referral to speech and language pathologist for swallowing assessment, they sent me to a GI doctor. And I think this was more just to shut me up and get me out of the door. It is our right to be treated humanely and properly medical and receive proper medical attention. Article 26, Habilitation and Rehabilitation. Article 26 is taking effective, appropriate measures to enable persons with disabilities to attain, maintain, and maintain a maximum independence, full physical, mental, social, vocational abilities, full inclusion and participation in all aspects of life. I feel this is highly important for people living with Alzheimer's because we are not offered any physiotherapy, speech, language pathology, occupational therapy, which will keep us engaged and maintain us to the best of our abilities for as long as we can. If we had a stroke, these would be offered so the person could regain what they have lost. Instead, they watch us deteriorate with no intervention. We need to continue to stand up and educate and fight for our human rights. It is known that in all countries that have a signed declaration, none have included dementia. Just this past Monday, I come here from Canada. Canada introduced uh, the Canadian Dementia Strategy. A Canada in which all people living with dementia and caregivers are valued, supported, quality of life is optimized, and dementia is prevented, well understood, and effectively treated. The principles they wrote it on, quality of life, diversity, human rights, evidence-informed, and result focused um, the objectives is, are to prevent dementia, advance therapies and find cures, and improve the quality of life of people living with dementia and their caregivers. Some of the pillars that they're looking at working under, collaboration, research, surveillance and data, information, resources, and skilled work. <coughs> To go along with the Canadian Dementia Strategy, we got funded $50 million to start to implement it. But that's not the end. The announcement that went along with the Canadian Dementia Strategy on Monday announced funding for the Canadian Consortium on Neurodegeneration and Aging. And that is a research-based, and I can't remember how much they got. Sherry, do you remember? God, you would put me on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> so let's say it's around the 50 million mark also for research into dementia.
that creates conditions that makes it really, really difficult for them to experience their human rights and those supporting them too. So um, with that humility, I stand here today and summing up the guiding principle of the, um, of the CRPD is, is presented in the preamble and it, it says this, recalling the principles proclaimed in the Charter of the United Nations which recognise the inherent dignity and worth and the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family. Now, dementia may not be a natural part of ageing, but it certainly is a part of our human experience. And people living with dementia are part of the human family. Dementia is in the world. So the big focus, of course, um, that everyone is looking at is around self-determination um, and support to achieve that, which is important. And as a very last resort, which I must say is a day-to-day -day reality for the vulnerable people that are supported in care institutions of, of any kind, that if, some, if, a, if a decision needs to be substituted, that as a last resort, it will be the will, the current will and preferences of the person that will be taken into account, not the best interests or, a, or based on their past or on some other status, their current will and preferences to guide decisions that are made. So what does that mean in the real world? Because as was said before, it's just about changing perceptions and changing practice in the real day-to-day -day concrete world. Because it does have to mean something. Because currently there are inhumane practices happening in establishments and institutions that support people living in the later stages of, of dementia. And I know that we all speak to the OECD report. The quote that says, dementia receives the worst care in the developed world, which is shameful. And the WHO Global Action Plan for Dementia, which says people with, with dementia are frequently denied rights in care homes. And they call for human rights to guide training, policy, and day-to-day -day practice in care homes. So what does this mean for us in this context? Well, it's got to mean, I think, at least a commitment to practice in such a way that reflects a recognition of the innate moral worth of all humans and a belief in their right to be self determined Would everyone agree in this room that, just as a premise point for us all to say, yep, yeah, we could commit to that, a commitment to practice in such a way that reflects a recognition of the innate moral worth of all human beings and a belief in their right to be self-determined. Is that? Yeah. So then I think we can agree that that's kind of our moral true north. Okay. Yeah. If we keep that in mind, I don't think that's hard for people to agree on. I may be crazy. <laughs> if that's like our super norm and, and, and that's what we're referring to, then that means all humans, all, all, all of our varied and unique expressions and experiences of living with this humanness and all of its incredible vulnerability uh, of being human, every, every permutation of that, we agree that that is what we're talking about because it says all humans. So that means ditching prejudice, it means ditching our focus on this cognitive bias when nothing else can be seen. That everything is defined by this Roman or Greek statute. And every deviation from that is somehow how we define our uh, what's wrong with this. Which doesn't give us much to look forward to it. So that means respect for diversity. I love that you said diversity because I think that's important in the most important way, in the diverse ways of being in the world, which we have to talk about. So it is about our responsibility to respect differences because we've already agreed that we are going to respect the innate worth of all humans. So I'm just, for this, for this situation, I'm going to remove the big ticket items. I'm going to take this back to practice. So I'm specifically going to remove, remove things surrounded with immediate risk and, and things that people talk about as needing further talk. So end of life decisions, let's take that off the table. Sexuality, even things like food consistency and, and choking, 
Let's just take those off the table and all those things that carry risk, we're just going to be talking about this minute right now, the real concrete day-to-day -day life of people living in the latest stages of dementia and residential aged care. Because then every moment is filled with the capacity to be treated like a human being. And very rarely do those big ticket items into the picture. It's much smaller than that. It's much smaller where citizenship and rights are. It's a much smaller geographic space that make up citizenship for people living with dementia. And it happens in the moment, and there's countless moments. And often these moments, we don't get to reflect on. I've worked as a carer on the floor. It's hard and heavy work out there. It really is. If you haven't worked out there for a while, um, do a double shift. You'll see, and it, very, very rarely we get a chance to reflect, let alone to ourselves or with our colleagues in a case conference. You know, I wonder what that might be. I'm just being honest, that doesn't happen. These decisions happen quickly. People's rights are removed quickly in this space. So looking back to our true north, if we're looking at people living in the later stages of dementia, they have a right to have rights in that space, in those tiny geographic spaces and moments. They have a right to express their desires, will and preferences differently. And for those to be honoured, for them to be afforded agency, because that's our commitment if we follow our true norm. A right to be citizens living with dementia, and we know what that means. These are citizens who are living in an often shifting reality, unpredictable reality, and dementia is a mystery. We do not know what is happening to people in their current experience of being in the world. But we need to know that, and we need to honour it. A right not to have their value, worth and status negated by our bias toward reasoning. We already know that the quasi-legal policies, we know the legislation based on capacity, it's not doing much to help the people I'm talking about. And it's not going to anytime soon. They do fall through those cracks and protections. But they have a right not to have the intentionality of their expressions, moods, and connections to the world precariously tied to our ability to understand it or tied to some previous character, Dad was never like that, or some previous preference because people shouldn't be tied to it. And believe me, when we do assessments in that space and it's written on a piece of paper, people are tied to it. They don't get a chance to make new decisions. And that's how we judge whether this is meaningful or pathological. Well, it seems like it bit inconsistent with the past because Mum would have never done that. Mum is here. By saying a statement like that, you are saying this body doesn't count. What counts is the mum that I remember and that's what we're tying intentionality to now. Because this person doesn't matter. This is just a shell. So that's something we need to be vigilant about and families need to be vigilant about. Yeah. Our commitment is to the person who is before us now. I can't change a lot of things immediately. Um, people with dementia interact and act on the world and in the world, sometimes very subtly, which means we do need to or presence and the type of space we need to create so that we can be attuned to those expressions of preference and agency if they happen in the moment and in real time. Unfortunately, the ones that are more over, as I've spoken before, we frequently refer to as behaviours. Not only is that negating their will and preferences now, it's depoliticising the conditions that actually contributed to those behaviours in the first place. Being apologise for every expression of their humanity and preference. So I stand in solidarity with care staff now in what I'm about to ask. Because until this paradigm has been resolved and it's, it's codified and entrenched in our care plans, in our funding tools, until it's been resolved, it's important for us, all of us in the room actually, to not lose sight that every single moment by moment interaction in a tiny geographic space comes down to acts of resistance for whomever happens to be in those vulnerable relationships. 
And that's the old way of thinking about it. But we need to resist them in our own personal way. And if we do have agency, as carers or anyone in that space, you know when that door's closed and it's you and a resident, human rights can be absolutely beyond the need express. They can't touch that space. We can manage that space and we can stand in solidarity with our most vulnerable citizens and say, not on my watch. For me personally, it was people like Dulcie. I'm going to call her Dulcie because she did teach me the most. But Dulcie represents all of the people I've worked with. Living with dementia who taught me things. These people inspired a passion in me to start on this never-ending solidarity project. And it's my solidarity with Dulcie that stretched me through time, through all of those years. When she stood with great defiance when people overrode her agency, I heard her in the shower saying, no, no. We weren't happy for her body not to be spotless because we have our own idea of what dignity means rather than her actually getting it. I stand in solidarity with her here today and to say her agency and her resilience and resistance has actually changed the world because here I am telling you about it. Those private troubles in the showers, that apologising, all of us here in this room have a common enemy and it's that. And we can join together in our, in our forces against that. These private troubles have a public name. At the moment, it's BPSD. It could be called anything else. It doesn't matter the word. It matters what we do with it. So I stand here in solidarity with that their agency made a difference. They are affecting the world. So I'm lucky enough to be here, tell you their story, leave it with you, and see if we can't band together to make the world better because we all have witnessed those moments of injustice. And because it shouldn't have happened to Dulcie and it shouldn't happen to anyone else like us. Our own suffering onto them because it's hard to see people 
in situations that we think we would find uncomfortable. And I would also ask her, you know, are you happy? And she would say to me, yes, I'm happy. And I would ask her, are you sad? And at one point I, I asked this to her, and she turned around to me and looked at me with fury in her eyes and said, no, I am not sad. And so you know, to, I was sad to see her in a situation that felt sad to me. But she wasn't sad. So I think this speaks really well to, to Daniela's point. The, the issue, however, is what happens when people cannot communicate in any way using words or body language or, you know, they're in a state where it's very difficult for them to make their wishes known. So I don't know how we deal with that. That's, a, that's another space for another day. <laughs> all of, there is a space and all of us know it. Anyone who gets moved by music and we experience something where we have that feeling that we know someone's entered a room but we don't know why. I don't have words for it. It's inexplicable, but our bodies feel it. It's the best we've got. I, I deeply believe in that. Yes, I think it's spiritual, but I think when we're working with people who are at that level, are deep, through deep connection, the best we have is to connect with them deeply and to feel that that is all we have left. I, I believe there is a space where I think if we spoke privately, any of us, that in that deep connection with someone living in the final stages of dementia, there are things we know. I can't give you any evidence to support that because there's, there's, there's nothing that could measure it. I don't even have words for it. I, I think we've used our time. Should we? We have someone over here. Sure. Can we do? Okay. Are you okay with holding your breath for just you know a few more minutes? <laughs> okay. And I do not have a yes, no question. You know, so I apologize for that. Um, my question is, I think what we're hearing is amazing about how things are progressing to look at the rights of individuals that are living with dementia. But my question to you is, a part of what I'm finding so often is we get so, uh, we become so grateful that the fact that big business, big medical groups are willing to even consider the rights of individuals living with dementia that we still tend to, I believe, um, look the other way or we're so in our gratitude. Let me back up. Kate Swaffer last week with the UN, I read her speech and she talked about um, dementia villages. Now when the idea of dementia villages originally came out, I, I thought that was a wonderful idea. But then I heard her speak to them in a negative way because her perspective was so different and my thought was, well there's so much money that's gone into this, what are the chances that we're gonna start pulling that back despite what people with dementia say? And I find that example within this industry over and over and over again where we are so grateful that you would even think of someone with dementia and consider their feelings until the person with dementia contradicts what's being said. And my question then is, what are we putting in place where you talked about the Canadian program? So are people living with dementia just eye candy in these policies, or do they really have a say in what happens and how we move forward, and how do we make sure those rights stay out in the forefront? Okay, okay. I'm gonna field that question because as a person living with dementia, it doesn't come easy to get the government to listen. It's not one person alone living with dementia that makes the difference. And it's not all of us here today working 
here today that's going to make the difference. On this Canadian dementia strategy, people have been trying to get that in place for years and years and years. I'd say at least 10 years. We had to go and speak at the Senate of Canada. We had to stand up for our rights. We fought every step of the way to keep our foot in that door because really they didn't want people living with dementia helping out, but we wouldn't take no for an answer. We pushed forward, we pushed in there. We, you know, sat on boards, we did advisory work. So it's not just one person, it's a whole group of people that are like-minded that push forward this, what we're doing now. That's how we came up with the dementia strategy. So even though I was involved, I wasn't the only one, and there was people before me that worked on this so hard. I just happened to be the person when the strategy was implemented. But there's going to be other people that come after me that are going to push forward and want more. And this is our first dementia strategy. Is it perfect? Probably not. But. It's people living with dementia, as long as we keep on them and pushing forward, that's how things change. Please join me in thanking these catalogs.